This is a production of Cornell University. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Roger Gilbert. I'm the chair of the English department. And it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event in the Cornell Reading Series. Uh, as always, I want to thank David and Barbara Zelaznik for their generosity in making this series possible. Um, and I'd also like to thank the English department staff, especially Sarah Rice, for all the work that she puts into organizing these events. Uh, and let me also take the opportunity to thank our stellar creative writing faculty for everything they do to support the literary arts at Cornell. So today we have a rare opportunity to hear two of the rising stars of contemporary uh, African literature read from their work. Uh, perhaps I should say African American literature since both these writers have lived and been educated in the US and yet their work is so deeply connected to Africa that they need to be thought of as thoroughly transnational and transcontinental in their scope. Both of them have written novels that move between Africa and North America, mapping a space that is not one of diaspora or exile, but of fluid migration. Now, I have the happy task of, uh, of introducing Makoma Wangugi, who also happens to be my colleague. Um, the thing I want to emphasize about Professor Ngugi is that there's always more. And uh, let me try to explain that. Uh, we hired him three years ago as a scholar of African literature, about which he has written brilliantly, uh, with a particular focus on the issues of standard English, vernacular English, and African languages. Uh, his research encompasses more than African literature, however. He is also considered how these issues relate to the work of the 19th century English poet John Clare, uh, among other figures. Now, as we quickly discovered, Mukoma is also more than a scholar. He has published two incredibly absorbing crime novels, both of which are for sale here, Nairobi Heat and Black Star Nairobi, uh, featuring a detective from Madison, Wisconsin, which uh, is coincidentally where Mukoma earned his PhD. <laughs> Uh, named Ishmael Fofona. Uh, these are far more than standard detective novels, though. They also explore the complexities of Kenyan politics and the international forces that impinge on them. But Makoma is more than a writer of crime fiction. He's also the author of a novel that deals with African music, in particular the Ethiopian musical form called the Tizita. And he also has a forthcoming novel called Mrs. Shaw that I know nothing about, but <laughs> eagerly await. Uh, there's more. Makoma Wa Ngugi is also a poet. He studied with Derek Walcott at Boston University, and he's the author of two collections of poems, Hurling Words at Consciousness and the forthcoming Hunting Words with My Father. But there's still more. Uh, Makoma is a prolific political commentator who has published many incisive essays in The Guardian, The Los Angeles Times, and elsewhere. And there's even more. Recently, he has raised funds for a prize to be given to writers working in African languages. I could go on. Uh, there are still further layers to this man that I have not yet revealed. But uh, I think at this point, you want to hear from him. So please uh, welcome Mukoma Wangi. Uh, yeah, no, I don't get a nickname that says there's always more. <laughs> no, no, but I'm just, thank you for the very warm introduction. Um, you know, and also thanks for the creative writing department um, for allowing me, because I've, I've been here mostly as a scholar, so it's nice to take off my scholarly hat. You know, and I, I like to think of my fiction and my poetry um, as, as a place where my literary theories go out to play, right? You know, very serious play, depressing play, violent play. You know, uh, but play nevertheless. Constructive play, I should add. Um, so let me say a little bit uh, the, how I came to write Nairobi Heat. Um, I was living in Madison, Wisconsin. I, I was doing my graduate work there. And I lived very close to the, to the football stadium. You know, it's a big football, um, it's a big football university. 
And one day, I never went to the football games, but I would go out drinking, you know, <laughs> which is pretty much the same, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but on this particular day, I, I came back very late, you know, and uh, when I got to my apartment, uh, on the third, I, I lived on the third floor, there was a white woman passed out uh, in a cheerleader outfit, you know. You know, I think she had just stumbled from the football game and gotten lost and then, you know, just wandered up. I didn't know her. Uh, so I called the cops. And the cop who came, uh, they came with an ambulance as well, but the cop who came was African-American, right? You know, and at some point I was just standing there, you know, and there was nothing much, much to the story beyond that. You know, they just came and whisked her off, you know, to detox. But at some point I was standing there thinking, wow, this is interesting. You know, here I am, an African. Uh, here's an African-American detective, you know, and between us, uh, a white woman who is passed out. So in the novel, that's, that's, that's the tripod of the novel. So in the novel, it's... Um, an, an African-American detective called Ishmael, as, uh, as, as Roger is saying, um, and, uh, and a suspect um, called Joshua, who is a, he's, he's, um, you know, like a hero from the Rwandan genocide. And of course, uh, a white woman who in this case is dead as opposed to passed out. So, and you know, and, you know, and the section I want to read takes place now um, when, when Ishmael now goes to have a first confrontation uh, with his suspect. Walking around the dead girl, I stepped up onto the porch from the side. Home is where the heart is. I read as I wiped my shoes on the mat and knocked on the door. There was no answer, but the door wasn't locked, so I let myself in. Inside the hallway was lit by, only by the flashlight, lights of the ambulances and police cars standing outside. All my instincts told me to draw a gun, so I did, steadying my flashlight in my left hand as I walked down in a long passageway and onto the sitting room. I tell them girl is dead, a deep voice said in the dark. I whirled around, pointing the flashlight in the direction of the voice. Why they mistreat her body? There was a man sitting in a leather lover's seat, absently twirling an empty wine glass by its stem. And as, I, and as I watched, he reached over and turned on a table lamp by his side. In the sunny brightness, I saw that he was immaculately dressed, a black and white pinstripe suit and a thin red tie expensive brown patent leather shoes without socks. You found her, I asked him, but it was more of a statement. Yes, I find her like that. I was one with, I was out with friends for cocktails, some is lounge. As I put my gun away, the man stood up. He was black, very tall, much taller than me and so thin that his head seemed to be growing, out, to be growing from his shoulders. He stretched out a bony hand that seemed to grow from the suit and grasped mine family. Their names? He gave me four names. I could look them up at the university, he said. They would vouch for him. He was, very, he, was, he was very composed, no bulging cartoid, shifty eyes or sweaty palms. None of the telltales that we are trained to look for. And what time did you leave Sami's lounge? About 12.30, I walk, I like to walk, to wash whiskey out of my blood. Half an hour, maybe more, maybe less, I get here. I call 911 when I find her. Did you use your cell phone? He handed it over to me. He had called the police at 1.33 a.m. I pointed out to him, but he just shrugged. Your accent, where are you from, I asked him. My friend, everyone has accent. Mine just mean I speak two languages, French and Kenya Rwanda. I'm from Rwanda and Kenya. My name is Joshua Hakizimana, and you as detective. You can call me Ishmael, born. <laughs> 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 you can call me Ishmael, born and bred here in Madison, Wisconsin. I replied, feeling very much like the village idiot in the face of his class and, pra and poise. Very, very sorry to hear that, he said with a short laugh and pointed to a chair for me to sit. I teach at, I teach at university. I'm a teacher of genocide and also testimony. You know what happened in, um, was she one of your students? I interrupted. I did not need a history lesson. No, never seen her. Not type that take my class, he sounded dismissive. What type is that? Bohemians and Pisco types, what you Americans call trust fund babies, no? He broke into a short laugh. Except for certain calmness, there was nothing to arouse suspicion. Whatever clues there were would be with the girl. Only an autopsy could tell us about her last hours. After that, we'd have to interview the neighbors, draw the local bus for someone who might remember her go through the last, or the last six or so years of university enrollments and missing person files and hope we get a lucky break. 
I asked Joshua if I could look around and he agreed. I left him and wandered off by myself, switching on the lights as I went. The place was huge, but it was the bedroom that interested me. Perhaps this whole mess was just a lover's quarrel gone too far. Sometimes things, are that, sometimes things are that simple. She was a student of his and wanted to break it off, or he wanted to break it off and she had threatened to expose him to the university authorities. I finally found it. There was only a huge bed, immaculately made up, and a nightstand with nothing on it except a lamp. I opened the closet and found rows and rows of suits, each ready with a black shirt and matching shoes beneath it. In the adjoining bathroom, there was a single toothbrush on the sink next to a tube of organic toothpaste. The medicine cabinet was empty. It didn't look like I was going to find anything useful, so I went back downstairs to find him sitting in the same position with his wine glass now half full. I pointed to his shoes and asked him about the socks. Sometimes I forget. Absent-minded professor, no? He said with mock sadness as he stood up to walk me to the door. How did you know the girl was dead, I asked as I gave him my card. Detective, where I come from, death is a companion like lover or good friend. Always there, he said as we stepped outside. So, so let me read you um, another passage from, uh, by this time from Blackstone Nairobi, it's the sequel. Uh, the sequel to Nairobi Heat. You know, and the, the sequel takes place in, um, during the 2007 post-electoral violence in Kenya, and, and then of course during the election of Obama here. And it, it was a difficult novel to write, uh, but what I tried to do with the novel was to mimic the way the violence you know, sort of crept up upon us. We didn't see it coming. Um, so we were just going about life, you know, uh, everybody was just going about their life and so on and so forth. There were little telltales. And then just one day, the violence just started. Um, so and in this, in this, what's happening now in this instance is that, um, that O, the African detective who partners with Ishmael, uh, they have lost someone close to them and they're trying to get that person buried, but the inter-ethnic, the et ethnic strife keeps interfering with that. You know, so and they get somewhere where there's a roadblock, you know, manned by a young, by young men. The makeshift roadblock and the 10 or so young men armed with machetes, knives, stones, flashlights, and kerosene lamps running toward us took us by surprise. We tried to reverse, but behind us another roadblock had hastily been erected. The Land Rover could, also, the Land Rover could take most terrains, but we were surrounded by trees. We had been overrun by events. Now it was a question of basic survival. O jumped out of the car, went to the trunk, came back with two AKs, and handed one to Muddy. Muddy and I stepped out, leaving the engine running and the lights on. I had faced death many times before. I had even walked into a KKK camp alone, but this was different. If they got to us, O, a Luo would be killed on the spot. For Madi, unable to pass because she spoke a queer with a Kenya Rwanda accent, and me, who could barely ask for water to save my life, could go either way. We were armed with new guns and they had machetes and old guns that looked like hunting muskets. But there was three of us, and there were at least 20 counting the ones man in the roadblock they had erected behind us. If some of them were ready to die, they would get to us. But we had an advantage. I reached into the Land Rover and turned the lights on to high beam, blinding the young men coming toward, towards us, an old trick that made them approach cautiously. There was still the matter of those edging closer and closer from behind, the glowing red tail, the, the glowing red tail lights acting as a beacon. O sent out a growl from his AK into the air, and everybody stood where they were. Muddy hopped back into the Land Rover, crawled all the way to the rear, and opened the door so that with her AK she had us covered. O motioned to me to speak to the young man. I understood. His low accented Kiswahili would only heighten the situation. I lowered my Glock and waited and walked toward them. I'm an American. Never before had those words sounded so hollow and devoid of meaning. I stupidly thought, as I, I stupidly thought, I might as well have announced that we came in peace. And we are here to make burial arrangements for a friend, I added. There was some murmuring among the two young men. There was some murmuring and then the two, two young men stepped forward. One of them held a gleaming machete and the other an old hunting rifle. The one holding the machete spoke in Kikuyu, but it was not until the other one holding the musket started translating that I understood what was going on. The leader didn't speak English and needed, and, and needed, and needed an interpreter. We have no quarrel with you, Mr. American. You can leave and greet Mr. Obama for us when you get back home. Uh, Mr. Obama, that Luo, he's very lucky to be American. 
The leader said through the interpreter pointing the machete at me. Can the others please identify themselves, he asked. My name is Madi and this is my home, uh, she yelled back. This is not your home, you're a guest and we treat guests with respect. You too may pass, the man replied. And the third person, who are you, the man asked, pointing at, at all. I'm a Kenyan just like you, O shouted back. I saw them start, but another, but another growl from O held them back. We could not afford to draw, to draw fast blood. However, we could remind them that they had lives to lose. Identify yourselves, O challenged them. We are the protectors of our land and wealth, the leader said proudly. Your people are killing our people, and for that you have to pay, he added as a matatu, it's public transportation, as a matatu came from the other side of the roadblock. The passengers were ordered out. I could make out flashlights going over ID cards. All the passengers climbed back in except for one man who was hardened into the surrounding bushes as he pleaded for his life. Let the man go, just let him go. What has he done to you? Do you even know his name? I asked the leader. Do you know what they're doing to our people in Kisumu? Did you hear about the church in the Rift Valley, little children, women screaming, burning to death, the man asked me. The passion in his voice, this was not going to be easy. That man, he had nothing to do with it, nothing at all. This is not justice, this is murder, I said to him, thinking I could nudge little, I could nudge the little flame of humanity I had in his voice into empathy. Murder, justice, you think I care? It's one less of them, he screamed at me. He yelled something in Kikuyu to his men. We had loud screams and then silence, except for the rustling as the murderers emerged from the bushes. The man was dead. There was nothing we could have done for him. Um, yeah, so let me just leave you with that taste of the, of, of the, of the crime fiction. Uh, how much time do we have left? Or, yeah, so, and then use the, 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 the minutes I have to reveal more of my layers. Uh, <laughs> I'll be using that a lot, Roger, I should say. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and read, um, and you know, I have a collection of poems coming now. My first collection was in 2006, so it's been long overdue. So I want to read two poems. Um, the first one is also, the, 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 I get the title of the, of the collection of poems uh, from the first one called Hunting Words with My Father. My father is a writer. Um, you know, I'm better, but he's a writer. <laughs> you know, so, but this was his first, for his uh, 70th birthday. Um, you know, and part of it is memories of, uh, of growing up, uh, well, fetching him tea and just watching him write. And I don't know, having conversations about writing, as much as you can have a conversation with a, with a six or seven year old. Hunting words with my father. One morning, I burst into my father's study and said, when I grow up, I too want to hunt. I want to hunt words and giraffes, pictures, buffaloes and books. And he, holding a pen and a cup of tea said, Little father, to hunt words can be dangerous, but still, it is best to start early. He waved his blue pen and his office turned into Nyandarwa forest. It was morning, the mist rising from the earth like breath as rays from the sun fell hard on the ground like sharp nails. Little father, do you see him? My father asked. No, I said. Look again, the mist is a mirror, do you see him? And I looked again, and there was a Maasai warrior tall as the tree, spear in hand. Shadow him. Find his movements, shadow him until his movements are your movements. Running my feet along the leaves, I walked to where he was, crouched like him so close to the earth, feet sinking deeper into the earth as if in mud, turning and reading the wind, and fading into the mist till I became one with the forest. For half a day we stayed like this, tired and hungry I was ready for home. But my father said, I did not say this was easy. You cannot hunt words on a full stomach. And just as soon as he spoke, there was a roar so loud and stomping so harsh that hot underground streams broke open like a dozen or so water pipes, sending hissing, steaming water high into the air. I turned to run, but the Maasai warrior stood his ground. As the roar and thunder came closer, his hair braided and full of red ochre, turned into dreadlocks so long that they seemed like roots running from the earth. When the transfiguration was complete, before me stood a Mau Mau fighter, spear in one hand, homemade gun in the other, eyes so red that through the mist they looked like hot molten cinders, the long, dreadlocks, the long dreadlocks a thousand thin snakes in the wind, the leaves and grass and thorns rushing past him. You must help him. Just, don't just stand there. Help him, my father implored. But just as soon as I had closed my little hands into fists, the lion appeared high up in the air, body stretched the whole length, 
as the Mau Mau fighter, as Mau Mau fighter pulled the spear like it was a long road from the earth. The lion mid-air tried to stop, recoiled his talons to offer peace, but it was too late, and he let out another roar as its chest crushed into the spear, breastplate giving way until the spear had edged its way to, to the heart. Dying then dead, he continued his terrible arc and landed. I waved, and the picture stood still. My father came to me and asked, why have you stopped the hunt? I said, but we killed it. We have what we came for. I pointed to where the Mau Mau warrior was pulling his spear from the carcass. But my father shook his head and said, you have done well, but look closely. How can you carry all of that in a word? How can we carry that home? It's too heavy. I laughed and said, but father, you'll help me. He pointed to the ground, to a steady flow of a bright, thin red river, furiously winding down the grooves of the spear to the earth. I too pointed, unable to speak, the beauty larger than my imagination. I was confused. I had no words. Come, let us go home, little father. When you are of age, you shall find the words, he said. But always be careful. To hunt a word is to hunt a life. Um, you know, let me read you my final poem. Um, so in my first semester here, um, this, is all, this will also be in that collection. My first semester here, I taught, uh, I taught a creative writing course. You know, and I'll give my students assignments. But then I was, eventually I was like, well, what if I did the assignments myself? You know, <laughs> you know and it worked out quite well because, you know, then I would do some of the assignments and then, you know, essentially would workshop all the poems together, you know. Democracy. <laughs> so, but one of the poems I gave them, you know, that, that, that we worked with, worked on, uh, is called Bifocals. You know, the, the assignment was bring ordinary objects. So one day somebody brought out, you know, glasses and put them on the table. Um, bifocals. Now that I'm almost there, I can tell you, your eyes are the first to go. And with that comes the stories that begin with a lie. My, you haven't changed a bit since kindergarten. <laughs> My eyesight was so good, I could make out a fly buzzing above the I-90 wear signposts as I drove across little towns at the speed of light. My eyesight was so good that I got an award for the most 2020 sighted motherfucker to ever set foot in the New York DMV. My eyesight was so good, but sooner or later the warning, objects are closer than they appear. Newspaper print, a cookbook, simple instructions to build in an Ikea desk. Sooner or later the indignity of pulling out a pair of bifocals from their all leather pouch and the unpracticed awkward wearing that at first lances your ears and at least once up your nostril and the feeling that you cannot shake of someone, an older sibling perhaps, holding a finger an inch from your face and saying, but I'm not even touching you. <laughs> and your turn to tell the in inevitable joke. My eyesight was so good that I, my eyesight was so good that I found needles in haystacks for play. I say, you once could see, but now you can bling. Go on with your postrate about to go. Wear your gold rim bifocals with pride. You have earned them. I thank you. Yeah, that, that does, you know, um, I'm, I'm also very happy to be here with, uh, with No Violet. Um, if we have time, I can tell you stories from other gigs we have done. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Elena Maria Viramontes, and I'm a professor here in creative writing. And it's uh, my utmost pleasure to be given the opportunity and the privilege to um, introduce one of our own, No Violet Burawejo. And um, I came to know No Violet, or as we called her here, Elizabeth, as a graduate student and later as her committee chair for her MFA thesis. She is, without doubt, one of the most interesting, provocative, and eloquent voices writing today, something that our creative writing program at Cornell has always been known to nurture. Born in Zimbabwe, No Violet has experienced firsthand the violence of decolonization and its poverty-stricken aftermath. For as we know, poverty is the worst form of violence. Once here in Ithaca, she set out to attempt to write out this violence, but was challenged by the restriction of how to capture such brutality in both mind and body without forsaking the resiliency of hope and love that many of her characters possessed. Dedicated to this project, she fiercely worked. To say that she was simply disciplined 
is to not acknowledge her incredible hours of work she put in in financing, distilling, structuring, and restructuring her creative impulses into narratives, into stories, into chapters. There was a real, real, real passion for her to get these stories to first out, then to a local audience, then to a global audience, because the innocent have for too long been silenced. Fortunately, her work did pay off. Nobel laureate M. J. M. Courtsy, who is a supporter of her work, included a story snapshots in his edited anthology, New Writings from Africa 2009, when uh, No Violet was here. And then, and then came her novel, We Need New Names, published in 2013. And it was recognized with the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for First Fiction, Hemingway Award uh, Prize for Fiction, the Barnes and Noble's Discover Award, and the National Book Foundation Five Under 35 Fiction Selection. We Need New Names was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and the Guardian First Book Award and selected in all sorts of lists, including the New York Times Notable Books of 2013 and the Barnes and Noble's Dis Discover Great New Writers lists, many, many others. No Violet also won the prestigious Kane Prize, what is known as the African Booker Prize, for her heart-wrenching story hitting Budapest. It has been a whirlwind for Noviolet, who only a few years ago graced our hallways with her presence. How can we tr truly give her a welcoming and warm reception to someone who continues to be loved by students, staff, and faculty here at Cornell? Well, there is one way. Some of you may be aware that graduates of our MFA program are eligible to teach here at Cornell as lecturers in English for the two years following their graduation. These lectureships are paid for in part by the generosity of Philip Freund, Cornell class of 1929, Lordy, whose will provided our program with an endowment intended to benefit creative writing graduate students. Since 2011, the Philip Freund Creative Writing Fund has enabled us to offer second year of those lectureships to all MFA graduates. Philip Freund's generosity did not end there, however. The Freud Endowment has always made a new, the Freud Endowment has also made a new benefit available to our graduates. We recently established the Philip Freund Prize for Creative Writing, an award intended to honor our graduates upon their first major publication after graduation. The Freund Prize enables us to award $5,000 to the newly published graduates who return to our campus. I'm especially pleased to tell you that Noviolet Bulawayo is a recipient of the Freud Prize for Creative Writing. Please join me in the celebration of her incredible accomplishments. That was uh, such a nice surprise. <laughs> and thank you for that um, wonderful introduction, Elena. Thank you all for, for being here this afternoon. Your presence is much appreciated. As most of you may know, I spent a good four years here at Cornell. A four years I remember with such fondness and gratitude for the generosity of the creative writing program and the talented faculty whose support I may not, without whose support I may not have realized my vision. I express my gratitude to Elena, Stephanie, Maureen, jo John, Ernesto, and the poetry faculty, not just for myself, but on behalf of the many young men and women who have come and who will continue to come to Goldwyn Smith 
to ride. Thank you for being our village. And speaking of village, I thank the English department and the Africana Studies program for their support while I was here, especially Roger Gilbert, Robert Harris, Ken McLean, and Michael Cork. I thank the wonderful ladies in the main office, Vicky, Michelle, Karen, and Marianne, who managed our day-to-day -day affairs. I'm actually uh, wearing earrings by, by Marianne, so. <laughs> Hopefully each time I get back, I'm, I'm getting a pay. That would be an incentive. <laughs> Hi, Stuart. And uh, last but not least, I wish to thank my amazing former students for teaching me how to teach and challenging me in ways that made me grow. I could speak for a long while about the many graces of this place but the morale of the story is that this place gave me all I needed and more to become. And for that, I am grateful. Thank you very much. So I, I will read from We Need New Names, um, which was a hard book to write because I wrote it to the drumbeat of a country coming undone. I was living here in the US um, and Zimbabwe was going through one of the worst you know, periods that I'd seen in, in my lifetime. I was born right after independence, and my uh, born free generation had, for the most part, experienced normalcy. So it was hard to see the country come to what it was. And I struggled with it a lot, because most of my family was there. And I remember Elena, you know, telling me to cope through writing. So writing became not just a, a project of bearing witness and asking questions, but it, it became about dealing with what was going on. This section is called How They Appeared. It was inspired by a series of, of uh, homeless people who had been displaced. Um, <coughs> the government had bulldozed people's homes when it faced opposition uh, back in 2006. And I was interested in what would happen to, to the suddenly homeless people. Um, and in my head, I created this shanty town called Paradise, in which part of the novel is set. The section is called How They Appeared. They did not come to Paradise. Coming would have meant that they were choosers, that they first looked at the sun sat down with crossed legs, picked their teeth, and pondered the decision. That they had the time to gaze at their reflections in long mirrors, perhaps pet their hair, tighten their belts, check the watches on their wrists before looking at the red road and finally announcing, now we are ready for this. They did not come, they just appeared. They appeared one by one, two by two, three by three. They appeared single file, like ants in swarms, like flies, in angry waves, like a wretched sea. They appeared in the early morning, in the afternoon, in the dead of night. They appeared with the dust from their crushed houses clinging to their hair and skin and clothes, making them appear like things from another life. Swollen ankles and blisters under their feet, they appeared fatigued by the long walk. They appeared carrying sticks with which they marked the ground for where a shack would begin and end. And these they carefully passed around, partitioning the new land with hands shaking like they were killing something. Squatting to mark the ground like that, they appeared broken, shards of glass people. They appeared with tin, with cardboard, with plastic, with nails, and other things with which to build. And they tried to appear calm as they put up their shakes, nailing tin on tin, piece by piece, bravely looking up at the sky and trying to tell themselves and one another that even here, in this strange new place, the sky was still the same familiar blue a sign things would work out for them. Some appeared with children in their arms, 
There were many who appeared with children held by the hands. The children themselves appeared baffled. They did not understand what was happening to them. And the parents held those children close to their chests and caressed their dusty and kempt heads with hardened palms, appearing to console them, but really they did not quite know what to say. Gradually the children gave up and ceased asking questions and just appeared empty, almost, like their childhood had fled and left only the bones of his shadow behind. Mother Love appeared with enormous barrels in which to brew a potent liquor that would make people forget. She also appeared with songs in her throat and the most colorful dresses in her bags. Despite the circumstances, she refused to appear like something coming undone. Generally, the men always tried to appear strong. They walked tall, arms steady at the sides and feet firmly planted like trees. Solid Jericho walls of men. But when they went out in the bush to relieve themselves and nobody was looking, they fell apart like crumbling towers and wept with the wretched grief of forgotten concubines. And when they returned to the presence of their women and children and everybody else, they stuck hands deep inside torn pockets, kicked little stones out of the way, and erected themselves like walls again. But then the women, who knew all the ways of weeping and all there was to know about falling apart would not be deceived. They gently rose from the earth, beat dust off their skirts and planted themselves like rocks in front of their men and children and sheikhs. And only then did all appear almost tolerable. So we fast forward to the US. My pro protagonist is a 10 year old who is able to get the chance to leave this space in search of the American dream. Um, so this one afternoon, she is hanging out with her aunt, who is ordering a push-up around the phone. Aunt Fostalina is busy trying to order her push-up bra on the phone, and you can hear that she and whoever she is speaking to are having issues. The problem with English is this. You usually can't open your mouth and it comes out just like that. First, you have to think what you want to say. Then you have to find the words. Then you have to carefully arrange those words in your head. Then you have to say the words quietly to yourself to make sure you got them okay. And finally, the last step, which is to say the words out loud and, hand them, and have them sound just right. But then because you have to do all this, when you come to the final step, something strange has happened to you and you speak the way a drunk walks. <laughs> and because you are speaking like falling, it's as if you are an idiot, when the truth is that it's the language and the whole process that's messed up. And the problem with those who speak just English is this. They don't know how to listen. They are busy looking at your falling instead of paying attention to what you are saying. I have decided the best way to deal with it all is to sound American. And the TV has told me just how to do it. It's pretty easy. All you have to do is watch Dora the Explorer, <laughs> The Simpsons, SpongeBob, Scooby-Doo, and then you move on to the So Raven, Glee, Friends, Golden Girls, and so on, just listening and imitating the accents. If you do it well, then before you know it, nobody will ask you to repeat what you said. I also have my list of American words that I keep under the tongue like talismans ready to use. Pretty good, pain in the ass, for real, awesome, <laughs> Totally skinny, dude, freaking, bizarre, psyched, messed up, like tripping, motherfucker, clearance, allowance, douchebag, you are welcome, acting up, yikes. 
The TV has also told me that if I'm talking to someone, I have to look him in the eye, even if it is an adult, even if it's rude. I don't know why Aunt Fostalina doesn't think to learn American speech like this, seeing how it would make her life easier so she wouldn't have to have a hard time like she is right now. I said the angel collection, Aunt Fostalina is saying. She has muted the TV and raised the volume on the handset so I can hear the other person as well. She sounds like a bored young girl. I'm sorry, what? I mean, I didn't quite hear that. Maybe it's my line. I can picture her head cold, the young girl, a frown of concentration on her face. Angel, 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 and Fostalina says, raising her voice even louder. There is silence, like maybe the girl is getting ready to pray. Angel, and Fostalina adds helpfully, dragging out the word like she's raking gravel. I silently mouth, angel, angel. I hear the girl make a small sigh. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean, ma'am, she says finally. You can tell from her voice that she's getting tired from trying to understand. What do you mean you don't know what I mean? <laughs> you don't understand what I'm saying? Such a simple word, Aunt Fostalina says. She is speaking with her hands and head now, and I can tell from her face that if the girl doesn't get it soon, it's not going to be good. I clear my throat to remind Aunt Fostalina that I'm in the room, so maybe she will ask me to speak for her, but she doesn't. Now she has scribbled the word angel all over the magazine, and the naked woman with a bra and underwear is all clothed in blank, black ink, the letters like tiny angry insects. Ma'am, I'm terribly sorry you are having these difficulties, but we have a website that you can order from. The girl on the phone starts her voice lifting. You can tell that she is pleased with the fact that she has thought of the website, that things are going to work out after all. I am relieved as well, and I start thinking maybe I should run upstairs and grab my MacBook for one for Salina to use. I get up from the couch. No, I am not ordering online. And for Salina says family, separate her words now, which is never a good thing. I sit back down. She pokes the Victoria's Secret woman's face with a pen as she says each word. I am not ordering online. I am speaking in English. So as far as I'm concerned, maybe you can spell it. Now the girl sounds like she is getting annoyed. Now you want me to spell it, and Fostalina says. She looks at me like she can't believe what she is hearing. But I look away at the TV. The woman is gone. There is a new one sitting on an exercise ball. I'm waiting for Aunt Fostalina to tell the girl on the phone off because that's what she sounds like she's getting ready to do. But something changes her mind and she sits up and starts to spell. It's A, Aunt Fostalina says. Her voice is a bit calmer. She has written the letter on the magazine as if to be sure. Okay, A is an apple. No, not apple. A as in anus. It's a different sound. <laughs> N, N as in no. G as in God. E as in it. L as in Libya. There you go. Angel, angel, angel. And Fostalina says, there is a brief silence, like maybe the girl is considering what she has written. And then she says, oh, you mean angel? Yes, angel. That's what I was trying to tell you all this time. I want a red one. And Fostalina says, rolling her R, the sound of it like something is vibrating inside her mouth. And I promise myself I'll never, ever sound like that. When Aunt Fostalina gets off the phone, she dials a number that must be busy because she quickly hangs up. She immediately dials another and she has to hold for a little while
before I hear her leave a message in our language for the other person to call her back. I know the reason Anne Fostalina is calling is that she needs to tell the Victoria's Secret story to someone in our language, because this is what you must do in America when something like this happens. You have, it, you have to tell it to someone who knows what you mean, who will understand exactly what you say, and that it is not your fault, but the other person's. Someone who knows that English is like a huge iron door, and you are always losing the keys. After leaving her message, Anne Fostalina just sits there as if something important is happening inside her, and she is waiting for it to come out kneel in front of her and announce that it's finished, and can it please go attend to other business. She also has this look. I have seen it many times before, but I still don't know whether to call it pain or anger or sadness, or whether it has a name. I am careful not to meet her eyes as she puts her card back in her purse and then gets up, walk downstairs to the basement, and slams the door shut behind her. I know that she will turn on the lights as she descends the creaking stairway, that she will take small measured steps like there is something down there that she dreads, that when she gets to the bottom, she will stand in front of the mirror that covers one wall and look at her reflection. I know that she won't be looking at her thinness, but at her mouth. I know that she will stand there and start the conversation all over and say out loud, in careful English, all the things that she meant to say, that she should have said to the girl on the phone, but could not because she, didn't find, she couldn't find the words at the time. I know that in front of that mirror, and for Stalina will be articulate. That English will come alive on her tongue and she will spit it like it's blood, like it's burning her mouth, like it's poison, like it's the only language she has ever known. Thank you. We have, just, we have just a few minutes left, but uh, Mukoma and uh, Novail would be happy to answer any questions from the audience. Nice shoes. Oh, thank yeah. You. <laughs> thank you. I saw my students here. Um, some of them have left. Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, any of my students here? <laughs> okay, okay. All right, all right. Yeah. not to be outdone. <laughs> oh, yeah, you have your students. Yes. Um, um, I read the book um, Nervous Conditions. Yes. Um, and I wonder, I, I wonder, I'm so excited to read your book. Um, and I don't, I guess I don't need to tell you, but I'll say it to the other people. No, like that, the, the coming of age story in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the author, Titi, I'm going to screw thank you, um, talks about um, the du dual identity that she has, that, and her almost, her loss of self mm -hmm. when she goes to the missionary school. Um, and I guess I just want to know, I mean, I mean, maybe both of you guys can answer this. I mean, that's one idea of having a dual identity and a loss of self. Mm -hmm. is, is that what the protagonist faces? And is that something that you can speak about? And it's something that's really interesting to me. Um, yes, I, I, I think when Darling moves from Zimbabwe to the US and encounters a different culture, a culture that is not as, um, as open to allowing her to come in and fit in and belong, means that she is perpetually at the margins. And uh, she is removed from her, you know, 
from the space that makes up her identity to this space that is in conflict with, that is not only with, in conflict with her identity, but also does not give her a new one. I, I, I think in nervous conditions, uh, there's a place where when Yasha said, or when, when Tambu said, when I went to, to Babam Guru's uh, mission school, I was living, I was a peasant. This was the person I was living behind. When I got there, I found a new, uh, a new self. I'm, I'm not paraphrasing it correctly. But I think the two books kind of speak to each other um, about that loss of, of identity. And I'm, it's something that I'm interested in, especially as somebody who came here at an age where um, it's quite easy. I mean, you're in your teens, and it's, it's quite easy to, to, to struggle. And I did struggle, but for me, unlike my protagonist, I felt like I, I was able to reconcile um, this new space and forge an identity. And part of it is because I had a culture and a, you know, a family here, so that helped. Um, yeah, maybe to speak to that a little bit as well. Um, yeah, but, but I, I think for, for the books like Nervous Conditions, and, and if you go a little bit earlier, uh, books like uh, Things Fall Apart, um, or, or if, if you think of books that were, that were set in the US from that generation, like A Child of Two Worlds by Mugoga, there are ways in which there are two worlds and, um, you know, and, and, and the characters either have to choose one or the other, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but there, there's a difference, I think, with the younger generation of, of writers, I include myself in the younger generation, uh, which is that um, the, the characters are not, uh, the characters are not guests in either of the cultures, right, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, Darlene, or in my case, um, you know, Ishmael, they're, they're, they're not guests, they, they have an insider perspective. And I think there's a way in which, yes, they have, they struggle with the issues, but they're speaking from the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Darlene can speak about Zimbabwe from the inside and the US from the inside. Mm -hmm. But I, I, what I found interesting is, look at the early reviews of, um, of We Need New Names, you know, from the New York Times to The Guardian. People are very uncomfortable with having these characters that are speaking from the inside, you know. So, I mean, I can, I can go on and on, but there is a way, there is a way in which um, we, we are reading the new work using an old lens, if you will. That's yeah. cool. Oh. 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 I was wondering if you all, each of you might say something about the genre. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I just... Uh, no, Violet, it's, you are seems hovering among genres. It's, it's when I when I hear you, when I read you, mm -hmm. it, and 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 Mokoma, it, mm. you are you, know, you are very specific. It seems in different genres. Mm. Is that? I mean, I don't know. Do in terms of mm. places and trans. Genre? Do you think about it? Um, I was talking about this earlier. Um, the idea of stories being stories. And there's a writer who said something about they didn't have a word for nonfiction in their language. Um, and for me, I think that's, that's how I approach the, my, my work, the kind of stories I'm telling, knowing that they are coming from a place of truth. So you will find me mixing fiction and non-fiction and a bit of, of, of poetry. Um, I, I, I'm not interested in separating, you know, because I feel like why, why not mix them together into a beautiful mess if you can, if you can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, 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 in some of my writing, like in the, um, in the detective fiction, uh, the femme fatale is a poet. She's a spoken word artist. You know, so that allows me to, and of course the books are political as well, but the, the spoken word artist then allows me to bring in my poetry. But I also like working with multiple genres, you know. Um, you know, I, I make jokes of how I think of myself as a musician who can play multiple instruments, mm -hmm. you know. And I think, for example, with political commentary, your purpose is very specific, you know. You're trying to say something about a particular pro political problem. Um, with poetry, I think for me with poetry is things I feel that I can't quite articulate. Uh, and with fiction, it's trying to answer a question that eventually I can't, you know. I don't know. So, so they did. The, 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 the different genres have their uses. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So this, the first one, the both of you, I'm 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we hear the other questions too, so that we can? Yeah, go ahead. Um, you were speaking sort of that I think how you transgress this binary of old world and new world, or um, um, how, and one character that I think is so interesting in doing that is the tourist in hitting Budapest. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you would speak about her a little bit and how she might relate to that idea of sort of transgressing that okay. that traditional binary. Okay. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. There's often a third identity, uh, and the identity you leave behind may address with the uh, older generation. Mm -hmm. The identity you try to assume, even if there's resistance when you get to the new place, mm -hmm. there's a third identity you try to go back home. Even if you're talking about the space of the inside, there is that same. Mm -hmm. uh, can you actually go home? Especially when you're talking about uh, coming from circumstances uh, that are quite devastating. I'm wondering if you guys can speak personally mm -hmm. whether or not you actually have to go home and how does that affect your writing and your character? Um, so I was in the U.S. for 13 years before I was actually able to go home. I went home in, uh, I, I believe it was 2013. Um, I just decided that I'm just going home. Um, it was a surprise. I didn't tell anybody except one high school friend to pick me up. And um, it was, I mean, 13 years is a long time, especially given the social political landscape. And um, the Zimbabwe, I knew the Zimbabwe of my childhood was gone. So I had to deal with this new monster that I couldn't quite make sense of. So just as I'd struggled out here, I felt myself struggling to understand and belong in the new space. And uh, there were times when my family or friends would call me an American, teasingly, you know. And of course, I'm like, I'm an American, really. Um, so I think that spoke again of how difficult it was to, to, to plug yourself in. And I hadn't thought about that a lot, you know. But after spending time and going back home, I, I realized that home is, home is home, you know. You have to, at least from personal experience, I feel like it is mine to claim and own you know, on my own terms. It's fine that I, I sometimes have to struggle, but it, it's mine to, to claim. And uh, things have, have calmed down, actually. I think it needs to be said that things are much, much better. It's no longer the, the Zimbabwe in this book. And um, people are, are, are going back and trying to, to pick up and, and fit in. In terms of, um, I forgot the first question. My audience, I, I feel like books are like open countries where everybody should have a visa and citizenship. So I, I don't specifically think of, a, of audiences because I find that it's limiting, you know, because you can't, you can't write for, for many people. So I just write a story from, from the heart and hope that people's humanity will allow them to connect. Though interestingly, I've heard Zimbabweans saying, yeah, you wrote that story for us, you know? You wrote it in our language. So I'm like, that's, that's, that's fine too. But I'm, I'm, thinking of a, I'm thinking of a bigger audience. Yeah, for me in terms of audience, you know, and maybe this comes from my direct political writing. Uh, for Nairobi Heat, really, I thought my audience was Africans and African Americans, because going to the issue of identity, I myself am interested in that question. Um, I was born here, left when I was very young, came back when I was 19. You know, so there are ways in which Nairobi heat mirrors that, right? Um, but, but I was pleasantly surprised with Nairobi heat. I mean, you know, it just got translated into German and it has done, it has done really, really well there. Um, you know, and, but I have my theories about that. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's something to do with the genocide, you know, with the genocide, because the book is dealing with genocide and then the Holocaust, you know, but I, I haven't, thought it through yet. Um, yeah, so, so but, but the people who are reading it, I mean, for me, I read my reviews, I read blogs, I read, you know, whatever. And that's why I got to know the audience had gone beyond, you know, from people who are mourning somebody who had died from cancer, you know, somewhere in Upper, in Ohio. Uh, you know, so, so the, the audience went beyond, you know, went beyond what I thought it would be. Uh, but in terms of identity and going back, 
a part of me feels nobody ever goes back, mm -hmm. right? If you leave, if, if, once you leave, whether it's within the same country, whether you, when you go to the university, you know, when you mm -hmm. go to work in the city, there's no, there's really nobody ever goes back. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but we can think of identity two ways. One is how we are perceived, you know, which is the sort of identity we, you know, we worry about and work with. And the other one is how we perceive ourselves, you know, and our place, and our place of, uh, in, in, in the places we call home. Mm -hmm. So I agree with Novel, and I'm the same way. I'm like, well, I, you know, when I go to Kenya, I claim it as mine. I come here, I claim it as mine. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, I, I think for our generation, it's a, a little bit more unapologetic, you know, in terms of, of, uh, of claiming world citizenry, if you will, or world citizenship. And, and I feel like very quickly that we're living in a time when people are from all over, you know. So that kind of mm -hmm. makes it easier to situate yourself because mm -hmm. you'll find yourself among people who also know something about living. So it, it makes mm -hmm. it negotiable. Yeah, shall we go here and then search in the previous moment? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that in addition to being in places in your fiction and in your personal life, mm -hmm. you two are among many other authors, occupying a kind of third space between African literature and letters and African American mm -hmm. literature and letters. And I'm wondering if you're getting pushback from mm -hmm. either of those communities of writers. Are African Americans mm -hmm. drawing a line of sorts saying that you're an African American writer if you mm -hmm. have this experience of slavery behind your writing? Or are you are they opening up to a new concept of mm -hmm. African American fiction and writing? Uh, can I, that, that's a question I think a lot about, right? But we can actually rephrase the question the, the other way around. Uh, are the first generation uh, Africans, you know, who are born here, do they identify with African Americans? Because that, that there is a problem there as well, which is, you know, when we come to the U.S., our parents, you know, wanting us to do well, or they come in with their, with their ideas of, uh, of, 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 uh, of essentially racist ideas of Af African Americans. You know, they come and they tell their children, don't interact with them, they do drugs, blah, 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 right? And you know, you know the, myth of the, the myth of the model Asian citizen or immigrant? That's what has happened to, to, to the Africans, you know? If you read most of the reports, um, you know, it's Africans that are doing well in, uh, in, in Harvard, they're doing well, well at Cornell, they're doing well in all these places. But usually that's said as a way of, of, of pointing out to say, oh, look, if, this guy, if these guys can come here and only be here for one generation and they're doing so well, What's wrong with African Americans? You know, so so the, the, for me, I rephrase the question the other way around and ask and, and ask how is the this generation of Africans being used uh, to deny issues of race, slavery, and history? Professor Mahant, I want to ask both of you about uh, assimilation and, and uh, both as writers and as um, Africans living in the, uh, the U.S. Americans in the moment when you start to define yourself um, as the latter. Mm -hmm. And I know we all, you know, thought a lot about the badass of assimilation and we write about it. Um, that's what a lot of modern African American literature has been about. What about the, the aspect that, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking autobiographically now, and the moment when you learn to also escape the, the, the comforting zone of the outsider who's always been misunderstood, mm -hmm. and to learn to speak uh, I don't know, radically as a we, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you don't, I, I'm not sure you, it's possible to just do that as a world writer, when you are a world citizen, it's also you are drawing on uh, indigenous traditions, I mean local American traditions, mm -hmm. and it's not quite becoming an American in that sense, you know, assimilating, giving up all identities, there's also a kind of growing, do you experience that? Did you experience that moment? I see some of your writing, but I wonder if that's something you can talk about. Not assimilation as giving up of everything mm -hmm. in the past and, and, and becoming this model that's speaking to us, but assimilation in the sense, for instance, the Jewish Americans have been through it in the middle part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. There's a new kind of identity, and you don't see that um, as, as uh, clearly among, say, Jewish Europeans and the British Jewish population is not quite in that sense of, um, uh, hasn't quite forged a nice identity. So, so that's kind of what I'm talking about. Is that a we that you find yourself using more frequently? I feel a bit of that in that piece of yours, um, mm -hmm. on the Guardian on 
the African as well as African American in Stone Bradle. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, for, for myself, I see it as a, you, you, can, you can come up with the theories, right? You can come up with the theories of identity and so on and so forth. But I think eventually it boils down to work. To be able to claim that we mm -hmm. has, to, has to be the we of work, right? And that means work against racism. Uh, to, in other words, to claim that we, you have to be in solidarity with other people in the strongest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. you know, so whether we are here in Cornell, you know, and uh, I don't know, cops are pulling guns on kids, you know, to be able to claim that we, means we also have to speak out against that. You know, so for me, I would say, in fact, for me, I think of a real, a real identity and solidarity has to be done through work. Otherwise, if you, if you look at the divisions between Africans, African students and African-American students, it, can, it cannot be breached by, by, by words. You know, it, it cannot, that, that we cannot be forged and formed by conversations. It has to be work, you know, whether it's something as, 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 a, as a political as electing Obama, <laughs> I shouldn't say it's a political. Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah, or uh, against police brutality and so on and so forth. So for me, my site would be to work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can continue the conversations at the reception upstairs. Please uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.